Let's begin with a, a story from the shadowy days of the Spanish conquest. In February of 1541, Gonzalo Pizarro, the half-brother of Francisco, the conqueror of the Inca, began a journey across the Andes in search of El Dorado and the fabled lands of canela, of cinnamon and gold. Leaving Quito with 220 soldiers, 4,000 native porters, and 2,000 pigs as food, the expedition crested the heights of the Cordillera and began a long, slow descent through the tangled lianas and stunted trees of the cloud forest. By the time it reached the tropical lowlands, where the riverbanks gleamed at night with black caiman, the horses and the hogs had long since been consumed, and most of the Indian slaves had perished, as had 140 Spaniards. The surviving men, reduced to stewing leather and wild herbs, scavenged for roots and berries that left half of them deranged by poison. In desperation, Gonzalo dispatched his second-in-command, Francisco de Aureliana, along with 49 men down a high jungle tributary in search of food and deliverance. Among this group was a white-frocked Dominican friar, Caspar de Carvajal, who wrote an astonishing account of the subsequent journey. Reaching the Rio Napo, just one of more than a thousand rivers in the Amazon basin, the men led by Aureliana mutinied, refusing in their agony to return upstream as per the original orders. The current was too powerful, no food had been found, and so Aureliana, in a kind of fit of legality for which the conquistadores were famous, officially resigned his commission that he could appoint himself the head of a new expedition, and abandoning uh, Gonzalo to his fate, Aureliana and his band set off into the unknown the day after Christmas in 1541. Heading down the swift-flowing Napo on a launch hastily crafted from jungle trees and nails scavenged from the hoofs of dead horses. Tormented by the sun, haunted at night by the roar of howlers, the low hallucinatory drown of frogs and cicadas, the unexpected bark of jaguar, they reached after several days the confluence of the Napo with the Ucayali. Then, to their horror, they found that the entire shore of the river was lined densely with Indian people, who did not particularly appreciate their arrival. They were attacked, three Spaniards died, targets of the flying death, Karari, the arrow poisons. Caspar de Carvajal was himself blinded in one eye by an arrow, which fortunately was not poisonous. And because of that, we had the good fortune to hear in time his extraordinary record of one of the most extraordinary journeys in the history of the Americas. His journal speaks of the anguish of men festering with disease, their lethargic bodies riddled with parasites, their guts wrenching from lack of food. It was cruel torment indeed, because with each passing kilometer, the bounty of the forest only got greater, the populations got denser, and the physical beauty and the number of the inhabitants increased dramatically before their eyes. Everywhere there was evidence of high civilization. After nine days and several hundred kilometers, the Spaniards entered the land of the Omagua and found to their astonishment that there were villages continuing, continuing for 320 kilometers all the way along the banks of the Amazon. There was no community more than one arrow shot apart. After six months, Aureliana's group passed the confluence of the Rio Negro, a river that would to exist on any other continent would be the second biggest river on earth. It is said that Aureliana went temporarily mad because he could not believe that on God's earth there could be a river of such a scale. Indeed, the scale of forest, river, and sky utterly unsettled their senses. And then they reached the mouth of the Rio Namandu, two days further downstream, 
where they met Indians who claimed to be the vassals of a great nation of female warriors. They were said to ride camels, to weave from the finest cloth. And then a day later, I mean a fortnight later, two weeks later, the expedition was said to actually enter the land of the Amazons and do battle with tribes of naked women, tall and white, with long braided hair woven around the head. Each woman was said to fight with the power of ten men, and it was only after several had been killed by the Spaniards that their brigadine, riddled with arrows, floated away to their rescue. And the further the Spanish went down the Amazon, the more elaborate were the signs of civilization. At the mouth of the Rio Tapajos, near the Brazilian city of Santarém, they were literally met by a flotilla of 200 war canoes, each carrying 30 men, each in full ritual regalia. Along the banks of the river were thousands of other Indian people staring in disbelief at these viracochas, in a sense, who had come down. Caraval even wrote of seeing in the distance evidence of very large cities. And then finally, on August 24th, 1542, eight months after setting out from the cool mountain air of Quito, they arrived naked, weakened by hunger, too wretched even to row as they reached salvation in the sea. And even still at the mouth of the Amazon, they became, remained confounded by the wonder of a river that had brought them there. In the delta, there were islands the size of European nations. The riverbanks lay over 300 kilometers apart. The expedition limped out to sea and eventually found its way to rescue. Returning to Peru, Carvajal wrote up his journals, and his journals were immediately ridiculed as nothing but pura mentiras. <laughs> his problem lay not in what he described along the riverbanks, but in this curious account of this tribe of female warriors, the so-called Amazons. And the reason this account was ridiculed was it, it was because it echoed so closely the stories of Herodotus and the great legends of Greek mythology and the stories of the women who were said to exist without a breast in the mountains of the Caucasus. And the discovery by Aureliana in, of savage women in the very heart of the Amazon was simply too much to believe because it wasn't as if they were the first to have found women. In fact, it turned out that wild, savage tribes of breastless women were on the itinerary of every conquistadore. Indeed, like the Fountain of Youth and El Dorado, this mythological, phantasmagorical idea was something that every Spaniard looked for. That's why California has its name, because Cortez dispatched his brother up the coast to look for the black queen, Califilia. In the Antilles, uh, Columbus reported tribes of female warriors, ad, as did Magellan. And so, because this sense of the women were on everybody's itinerary, his report in, 50, uh, in, 50, in um, Carvajal, Car 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 Carvajal's report was ridiculed. And so, buried by court gossip in Spain, ignored by history, it would not be published until 1895 even though it was the first European account of going down the river. And ironically, for history, had they not spoken about those tribes of female warriors, his relation would have been remembered for what he absolutely did see. The Amazon, at the time of European contact, was not an empty forest. It was, in fact, an artery of civilization and the home to hundreds of thousands, indeed millions of people. Now, the Amazon provokes cliché even as it defies hyperbole. It is, after all, the largest forest on Earth, a forest the size of the face of the full moon. Joseph Conrad described the jungle as less a forest than a primeval mob, a remnant of an ancient era when vegetation rioted and consumed the Earth. This was the image of the Amazon as green hell, 
But by the time I came along as a student of biology and botany in the 1970s, the jungle, a word that had long gone out of fashion, had become a, an Eden, a kind of delicate land, a counterfeit paradise that could only endure our ways for so long. And this idea of the Amazon and the tropical rainforest in general as being delicate derived from a basic understanding of the ecology of tropical rainforests versus temperate rainforests. And of course, in the temperate zone with the winters and the accumulation of organic topsoil, the ecological wealth of the ecosystem is in the soil itself. By contrast, in a tropical rainforest, with the high rates of humidity and decomposition, the living wealth of the ecosystem is the vegetation itself. Now this, and, and then, of course, the idea comes that if you eliminate that, that, that wealth of life, you set into motion a chain reaction of cataclysmic consequences. Now that idea, as a kind of general way of understanding the differences between temperate and tropical rainforests, uh, made some sense, but when applied to a forest the size of Europe, the size of the face of the full moon, it was as much slogan as science. But the notion of the Amazon as being a fragile place held for two reasons. First of all, it served a legitimate environmental agenda and the concern of, that we all had as to the fate of the tropical rainforest. Second, and much more important to the story of this film, is that it served, uh, it served to reinforce our preconceptions as to what it meant to live in the Amazon. By the time anthropologists entered the Amazon in numbers in the 1950s and the 1960s, the main basin itself, of course, had been depopulated for 500 years. An incredible rivering culture had emerged of the koboklos who used the adaptive traits of Indian people to find a life in the mother Amazon, but of the original inhabitants, inhabitants of the floodplain of the Amazon, all that existed were shadows in the sand, whispered messages in the forest. Anthropologists naturally were drawn to the so-called real Indians, the extant societies that lived along the margins of the Amazon basin, along the arc of the Andean Cordillera at the base of La Ceja de la Montaña. These were societies that weren't marginal in the sense of being primitive. They were marginal in the sense they literally lived at the margins of the Amazon basin, insulated in their isolation from the cataracts and the geography of the basin, protected from the west by the Andean Cordillera which was not crossed by roads until the 1940s. And so these were societies like the Kofan or the Warani, who lived generally isolated in the forest, but often very close to metropolitan areas. The Warani, for example, first peacefully contacted in 1958, fully five years after I was born, lived but 150 kilometers from Quito, a city that had been settled, of course, for well over 400 years. Now, these societies were fascinating, uh, but they were unique in certain ways. They were generally low in population. They tended to be isolated, marrying amongst themselves, often in open conflict with their neighbors. They had, of course, great gifts. But this became the image that we had of the Indian in the Amazon rainforest. Small populations living in a fragile environment, using slash and burn agriculture, a form of agriculture that was critically dependent on low levels of population density, to kind of squeeze a way of life out of this formidable place that was the Amazon. And this became the way we thought of both the Indians of the Amazon and the forest itself. The idea that somehow it was fragile ecologically and above all impossible for human beings to live in in any concentrations. 
The idea was, as many scholars of the time claimed, that the Amazon was a counterfeit paradise, a castle of immense biological sophistication built on a foundation of sand. The idea was that whatever became of these great populations described by the Spaniards, it wasn't even clear that Aureliana was telling the truth. It was as if contemporary scholars simply refused to pay attention to the eyewitness reports of the first Europeans to go down the river. Well, was this idea promoted so powerfully by largely North American anthropologists in the 1960s and 70s and even 80s, was it true? Well, preservation of archaeological remains has always been a problem in any tropical rainforest. But beginning in the 1980s, archaeologists began to unveil unknown mysterious worlds. At the mouth of the Amazon, evidence of great concentrations of civilization. Around Man uh, Manaus, great burial mounds indicating huge concentrations of people at the roughly around the year 1000 um, AD. Evidence that the, there were areas of land that had been intricately cultivated by human beings, areas where the entire forest actually existed of the remnant growth of as many as 138 domesticated plants, fruit trees, and palms. Moreover, botanists, as they began to explore the hinterland of the Amazon, began to come upon these curious anomalies. In the middle of the so-called sterile soils of the Amazon were these incredible tracts of rich black soil, clearly of human origin. These were soils that clearly had been created deliberately by human beings, using charcoal as a way of retaining both water and nutrients. In fact, ethnobotanists from Tulane University have suggested that as much as uh, a tenth of the upland forest of the Amazon, an area the size of France, consists of soils created by human beings. So these observations led other anthropologists to begin to question other assumptions, such as the whole origin of slash and burn agriculture. When I lived with the Warani in the early 1980s, they still had sto stone tools. And it, it absolutely confused me, this idea of how you could clear forested land with, it, with great efficiency with, steel, uh, with stone tools. Well, that idea also um, uh, uh, sparked the curiosity of an interesting anthropologist, Roberto Carnero, and he decided to experiment. And it turns out to cut down one tree a meter across with a stone ax took 115 hours, three weeks of eight hour days. To clear one half hectare plot of forest with stone tools took the equivalent of 153 eight hour days. Now, if you accept what people said about slash and burn agriculture, such a field could only be worked for two or three years. Now, this simply didn't make sense. Given other obligations that we, knew, we know these societies had, uh, hunting, fishing, ritual obligations, it would have been totally impractical and utterly maladaptive to spend your entire life hacking at a tree with a piece of stone. In fact, it may be that slash and burn agriculture is in fact a relatively recent development in the Amazon that was made possible by the post-contact introduction of stone tools. And it, it, in fact, it may have been uh, this technology that allowed, um, uh, and it was only with the collapse of population that the people had enough land to allow for the gross inefficiencies implicit in slash and burn agriculture. What we realize now is that our entire understanding of the Amazon basin has for too long been influenced by these so-called marginal peoples. And to understand the prehistory of the Amazon through this lens is as absurd as trying to understand British civilization 
from the perspective of the Hebrides after London has been wiped out by a nuclear bomb. Within a century, of course, a combination of disease and slavery swept away the ancient civilizations of the Amazon. And yet, incredibly, there is one place in the Amazon, in the entire basin of the Amazon, where the rhythm of these great civilizations can still be heard and felt, the homeland of an extraordinary complex of peoples known as the peoples of the Anaconda in the northwest Amazon of Colombia. In 1975, when I first traveled to the Valpes, I stopped en route in Viao and stayed with a legendary naturalist, Frederico Medem, a legendary figure who had devoted his life to the study of the tropical rainforests of Colombia. And I remember that night, I stayed up all the night, Mambiando Coca, as he taught me the first ideas I had about the Amazon. His most prized possession was a shaman's necklace, a single strand of palm fiber threaded through a six inch crystal of quartz. He described it as both the penis and the crystallized semen of father's son, explaining that within it were 30 colors, all distinct energies that had to be balanced in sacred ritual. He said that the necklace was also the shaman's house, the place to which he went to take yahe. Once inside, he said, the shaman looks out at the world over the territory of his people and all the sacred sites, the forests, waterfalls, mountain escarpments, and Blackwater rivers, watching, watching, watching the ways of the animals. This was quite an impressive introduction to the Amazon for a 20-year-old Canadian. Long after Dr. Medem retired for the night, I read through the night a book that he handed to me by the great Colombian anthropologist, Gerardo Reicheldomatov. And I read of the importance of rivers. And for the Indians of the Valpes, rivers are not just roots of communication, they are the veins of the earth, the link between the living and the dead, the path along which the ancestors traveled at the beginning of time. All the peoples of the Northwest Amazon of the Valpes speak of a primordial journey up the Milk River of the East, sequestered in the belly of the sacred serpent, uh, with all the various hierarchical strata of their society linked in hierarchical order within the, the sacred canoe. And then, of course, all were brothers, children of the sun, and when the serpents reached to the center of the world, the people were spat out on the land, each society, each canoe giving birth to a particular culture on a particular river. And even today, that mythological memory continues to influence behavior in these societies. That is why throughout the Northwest Amazon, we find that these societies not only celebrate wisdom as opposed to warfare, but they have mechanisms to ensure that trade is facilitated and that peace is maintained. Not the least of which is a curious rule of marriage that you must marry someone who speaks a different language. And so in any one community, you may have as many as half a dozen languages spoken, but you never hear a child practicing a distinct tongue. They simply wait Lit, watch, listen, and one day begin to speak. And of course, all of this comes together in ritual. Now, totally intrigued by what I read in Reichel's book, I arranged passage the following morning on a military cargo flight to Me Too. It was like riding the back of a pickup truck through the sky. And I spent the better part of a month around Me Too, botanizing with the local people, Cubeos and Tucanos for the most part, but I never came close to the heart of their world, spiritually, culturally, or literally. The forests were simply too big, the distances too great, the cataracts too formidable. And then two years later, I returned to the Catholic mission of San Miguel on the Rio Pitaparana, an hour further into the forest from me too. And it was about as remote a location as you can find in the Amazon. But this too was a fleeting visit 
and challenges of language, because very few of the Barasana spoke Spanish, left me, in a sense, a stranger in their midst, with only a superficial sense of what was going on, and, of course, a deep sense of sadness, as many of us had at that time, a familiar l lament of anthropologists, that we felt that we were in a place where something incredible had happened, but it had happened a long time ago, and these societies were now disappearing worlds. But then, long after my first fumbling visits to the Northwest Amazon, something truly, truly remarkable occurred. In 1986, newly elected Colombian president, Virgilio Barco, appointed my good friend Martin von Hildebrand head of Asuntos Indígenas. And he told Martin, rather casually, to do something for the Indians. Well, Martin, who for years had lived and been adopted by the Tanumukos and first paddled the length of the Rio Piraparana as a young graduate student, did more than something. In five extraordinary years, he secured for the Indians of the Colombian la Amazon legal land rights to an area of some 250,000 square kilometers, roughly the size of the United Kingdom, establishing over 162 resguardos, titled lands that were then later encoded by law in the 1991 political constitution of the country. You never hear about this in Colombia, and you never hear about this abroad, but no nation state anywhere on the wor in the world has taken such a stand for the protection of the indigenous rights of its people. And this is something that Colombians should be screaming around the world. Every time there's the slightest violation of human rights in Colombia, it is on all the media around the world. But Colombia, in fact, has the most progressive policies for indigenous people of any nation state on earth. And so nothing like this had ever been done. It was an incredible experiment. And in the years that followed, even as Colombia was torn apart by the ravages of a war that was not of its creation, a veil of isolation fell onto the northwest Amazon of Colombia. And behind this veil of isolation, a new dream of the earth was born. And it was in that spirit that Martin in 2006 invited me to join him with a group of uh, uh, film crew from the National Geographic to do a documentary unlike any documentary that had ever been done in total collaboration with the people and bringing together not only their intellectual capacity but considerable intellectual capacity on our part. We were four PhDs who had devoted our lives to the study of the Northwest Amazon. We came together in this very special moment in time to create this film. And I remember the night before we flew out of Me Too, Martin and I huddled on the cement floor of our modest lodgings, taking coca, mambiando, y taking tobacco, as Ricardo Marin, a Barasana shaman, identified on a large map created by Fundacion Gaia Amazonas, the sacred sites we are to see from the air and visit over the next month by river and trail. Martin and his colleagues at the Fundacion Gaia Amazonas, working with more than 50 ethnicities in the Colombian Amazon, had codified in two dimensions on maps what Ricardo knew to in fact exist in multidimensional space. In the ba in Barasana language, there is no word for time, and the sacred sites are not memorials or symbols of past events. They are living places that e internally uh, inform the present, and thus for the Baras for the Barasana, the past is the present, and the sacred sites are to this day inhabited by mythic beings. So as our plane rose from the clouds like a dragonfly, it burst over the canopy. And for over four hours, we traveled over the sacred homelands of the people of the Anaconda. And we landed late that day in the old abandoned Catholic mission of San Miguel, the very place I had visited on that trip inspired by Reichel Domatov. I recognized the fields, the setting of the great longhouse, the white sands along the river where the children bathed in the black waters of the Piraparana. 
but otherwise everything was different. A mission that I recalled as a sad place was now a place of glory. On our very first night, a hundred or more people gathered in the Maloka, men in feather regalia, to dance, chant, and take sacred medicines, coca, tobacco, chicha, and yahe. Shaman huddled over calabashes of spirit food, whispering and softly singing spells. For the very first time in my life, I heard the haunting sound of the sacred Yuripari trumpets created by the ancestors at the dawn of time. Long condemned by Catholic priests as symbols of the devil, these mythic instruments had been crushed and burned during the years of the mission. That their sound was still here, inspiring new generations of Barasana, Makuna, Tatuyos, and other peoples of the river, suggested very powerfully that this culture was very much alive. In the 30 years since my original visit, the only thing that had disappeared on the Rio Piraparana, as Martin said, were the fucking missionaries. <laughs> Over the course of nearly a month, guided by Martin and Ricardo and other Barasan and Macuna leaders, such as Maximiliano Garcia and Renel Ortega, we traveled the rivers, attended ceremonies, visited sacred sites, cataracts where culture heroes had done battle with the forces of darkness and brought order into the world. Flying in to join us midway through our sojourn was Stephen Hugh Jones, the former head of anthropology at Cambridge, who with his, with his wife had first lived with the Barasana in the late 1960s. He returned now as a kind of respected elder, fluent in the language, a man who incredibly had de dedicated his entire life to understanding the cosmology of the Barasana and their neighbors. And so his presence, along with the presence of Martin, turned the journey into an ongoing tutorial of spirit and culture, an endless series of revelations that each day brought a deeper understanding of a subtle philosophy that was dazzling in its sophistication and profoundly hopeful in its implications. There is no beginning and no end in Barasana thought, no sense of a linear progression of time, destiny, or fate. Theirs is a fractal world in which no event has a life of its own, and any number of ideas can coexist in parallel levels of perception and meaning. Scale succumbs to intention. Every object, as Stephen explained to me, must be understood at various levels of analysis. A rapid may be an impediment to travel, but it is also the house of the ancestors. A stool is not a symbol of a mountain. It is in every sense an actual mountain upon the summit of which sits the shaman. A row of stools is the ancestral anaconda. The corona of oropendela feathers is not a symbol of the sun. It really is the sun. Every single feather, an individual plume of the divine. And so the infinite elements of the Barasana world spin through the consciousness and inspire all life. And if civilizations are to be measured, however crudely, by monumental architecture, then you only have to look at the Maloka, the longhouse of the Barasana, which in its elaboration symbolically, in its sophistication in terms of its mythic resonance, rivals anything the Inca or the Maya ever built as you'll see in the film soon to be shown. And so what we discovered was that, in fact, every single gesture in the lives of the Barasana is a prayer not only for the continuity of the people, but for the continuity of the entire world. Their forest at every level is saturated with meaning and cosmological significance. Every rock and waterfall embodies a story. Plants and animals are but distinct physical manifestations of the same essential spiritual essence. At the same time, everything is more than it appears, for the visible world is but one level of perception. Behind every tangible form, every plant and animal is a shadow dimension, a place invisible to ordinary people, but visible to the shaman. And so we discover through time 
that in Barasana culture, there is no separation between nature and culture. Without the forests and the rivers, humans would perish. But without people, the natural world would have no order or meaning. All would be chaos. Thus, the norms that drive social behavior also define the manner in which human beings must interact with the wild, the plants and the animals, the multiple phenomena of the natural world, lightning and thunder, the sun, the moon, the scent of a blossom, the sour odor of death. Everything is related, everything connected, a single integrated whole. Mythology infuses land and life with meaning, encoding expectations and behaviors essential to survival in the forest, anchoring every community, every maloka, to a profound spirit of place. Thus, these cosmological ideas have profound ecological consequences, both in terms in which the people live and the impact they have on their environment. The forest is the realm of the men, the garden of the realm of the women, both inform the other. And all of this, in a sense, comes together in ritual, when the men and the women come together in sacred space within the shadow of the maloka, which is both home to the community, but also a symbol of the universe. And as you'll see in the film, hovering over the universe itself is the universal maloka anchored by the sacred sites. It is to these sites that the Barasana go when they ingest yahe, this powerful psychotropic preparation that allows you to face down the jaws of the jaguar. And it is in the rituals where life becomes full. The corona is not a symbol of the sun, it is the sun. When the man dances, he becomes the ancestor. He doesn't simply remember the ancestor. Ricardo said to me one night that white people see with their eyes, but the Barasana see with their minds. They journey both to the dawn of time and into the future, visiting every sacred site, paying homage to every creature as they celebrate the most profound cultural insight. And this is their insight that we should listen to, the realization that animals and plants are only people in another dimension of reality. This is the essence of Barasana philosophy. But consider for a moment what this implies, what it tells us about this culture and its place in history. This is what we know. It is a tradition based on knowledge acquired through time and intense priestly study and initiation. Status accrues to the man of wisdom, not to the warrior. The Malokas rival in grandeur the greatest architectural creations of humanity. The Barasana have a complex understanding of astronomy, solar calendars, intense notions of hierarchy and specialization. Their wealth is vested in ritual regalia as elegant as that of a medieval court. Their systems of exchange, infinitely complex, facilitate peace, not war. Their struggle to bring order to the universe, to maintain the energetic flows of life, and the very specificity of their beliefs and adaptation, leaves open the very remarkable possibility that the Barasana and their neighbors are the survivors of a world that once existed the complex societies and chieftains that so astonished Caspar de Carvajal and Francisco de Orellana, the lost civilizations of the Amazon. Perhaps, indeed, it's quite possible that in the adaptation and the cultural survival of the Barasana, the Macuna, and the other peoples of the Anaconda, we can literally see today something of the beliefs and convictions that allowed untold millions of people to live along the banks of the world's greatest river. When the Barasana today engage in ritual and take Yahe, this astonishing potion that many of you know well, and that they say that they travel in multiple, multiple dimensions, reliving the journeys of the ancestors, alighting on the sacred sites, accomplishing all of these remarkable 
spiritual deeds. It is because they really do. When we say that the Barasana and their neighbors both echo the ancient pre-Columbian past and point a way forward, embodying a model of how human beings can live and thrive in the Amazon in great concentrations, it is without laying waste to the forest, it is because they really can. And none of this would have been known without the efforts of Martin, Stephen Hugh Jones, and indeed nothing would be there to witness today, and this film would never have been made had it not been for the, ste the steps that the Colombian people took and the Colombian government encoded in national law to protect the land and the rights of the people of the Anaconda. This is a fantastic example because it shows that indigenous people and cultural diversity and the rights of human beings to live their own traditions does not take away from the authority and charisma of the nation state. It gives power to the charisma of the nation state if that nation state is prepared to accept diversity. And Colombia, to its immense credit, has been prepared to accept diversity, which is what makes your country so wonderful and makes me so happy to be with you tonight. I hope you enjoy the film.